Uh, my name is Diane Lewis and on behalf of First Mardi Gras Incorporated, I'd like to welcome you to our first Salon 78. Uh, out and Loud, the Gay Liberation Choir, 1981 to 1987. I'd also like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting today, uh, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And you will also see next to the stage the tribute banner, which uh, where people have written the names of 78ers who passed away. And let's remember these people and those members of the choir who are no longer with us as well. Now, our series of Salon 78 forums celebrates the upsurge of activism following the first Mardi Gras, both political and cultural activism. Today, we celebrate the Gay Liberation Choir and their activism through song and at times dance and other things, as I'm sure you'll hear. In February, as part of the Mardi Gras Festival, we have a Salon 78 Forum, Rainbow Immigration and Refugees, which uh, also celebrates the 1980s Gay Lesbian Immigration Task Force and looks at refugee issues right now for LGBTIQ refugees and asylum seekers. And that's on the 10th of February right here as well. Now today we have three choir members speaking, Dr. David Abello, who will cover choir history, drawing on the choir diaries kept by Paul Van Wright and images by David Urquhart. Marie Marsh and Paul Van Wright will take a more personal view of their participation in the Gay Liberation Choir. And all three speakers are up here. See if you can find them on, on, the, uh, on the slide. Marie's a bit behind the microphone though, as I would have been if I was in that situation. Uh, so basically, uh, and as you can see from the song sheets, uh, on your chairs there will be songs and you can join in. And we'll also have a Q&A session. And now please welcome our very first speaker, David Abello. Okay, I've had to fiddle with my psychiatric drugs to enable me to do this. And they should be peaking. Uh, I read right about um, about now. I think. Okay. All right. I'd also like to acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional owners, past and present, on whose lands we are meeting, and pay respect to their elders and emerging past and present. Okay. We are at Darlinghurst Street Fair. Okay. The first time I heard homosexual voices raised in song was in 1979 in Melbourne on a tram, one of a number of trams that had been put on to transport participants from the venue of the Fifth National Homosexual Conference, the Universal Workshops in Fitzroy, to the dance. We sang homosexuality, oh uh, sorry, Solidarity forever. The trams, the trams perhaps prophetically were decorated with pink sheep. Uh, this photo is from the age uh, from from the age in Melbourne. Most of the choir's first twelve members knew each other in the gay liberation movement, in the socialist homosexuals group, the gay solidarity group, the, the disciplets and the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence and Networks of Radical Fairies. They were together at various events early in 1981. The Displets were an occasional radical gender fuck drag group who were intent on subverting the naturalness of masculinity and the appeal of hypermasculinism. After successful outings to the Easter Show and Rush Cutters Bay Bowl, they had a Gidget Goes Gay moment on Tamarama Beach, disturbing the gay men there. <laughs> there are a couple of key radical fairy and gay liberation house parties and organised singing at the May Day March and Rally that year. In May there were meetings to found and build the choir in its repertoire. It was conceived not as a gay community choir like the San Francisco Men's Chorus with its normalising repertoire, 
but as a querying parody of one. The quiet appeared at a time when the gay and lesbian movement was debating about its relationships with the emerging gay, gay male community. One concern of socialists was the community's limited potential, I'm quoting Michael Hurley now, to produce a public homosexual culture that confronts both cons discrimination, gay rights, and oppression, gay liberation. The risks were the reduction of gay liberation to gay rights, a political engagement with the state in defence of petty bourgeois gay men, and, quote, the cap capitulation of revolutionary hope to commercial dominance. So, the alternative strategy was to invigorate its organisations, build its movement and solidarity with other sectors and the left, and better coordinate its efforts. In this moment, the Gay Liberation Choir emerged to play, in fact, both of these roles in some senses. The choir appeared at a time when lesbians were withdrawing from the gay movement organisations. It was nevertheless explicit that it was not a men's group. In a promotional in the Gay Solidarity newsletter, Ken wrote that the choir operates within the parameters of the modern gay male subculture, though not uncritically. This is very different milieu to the subculture of women's music that involves many lesbians. Yet it was formed as a gay liberation choir rather than as a gay male choir, and not, as is widely reported, the women are doing country and western at the moment. An initial strategy of the choir was to pierce the male-only social spaces of the gay community and to politicise discrimination and oppression at a time when homosexual acts were illegal in New South Wales. It was a short-lived strategy as the community grew, diversified and became more sophisticated. So, in its first incarnation, over 20 months, the choir sang at 88 events. It's quite a lot. Um, don't get dizzy trying to read them. You'll be able to see them all in the upcoming book. In its second stage, as a choir of lesbians and gay men, it performed over 38 months at 66 performances. Also a lot. So over the life of the choir, it had 90 members. In its second inception, there were 44 members, which included 25 women. So the kinds of events and places that the choir sang at included, take a deep breath, it says here in my notes, demonstrations, marches, rallies, parades, industrial actions, trade union campaigns, international solidarity events, suburban and regional lesbian and or gay groups, community fairs, garden parties, house parties, dance pubs, clubs, saunas, Marxist summer school. We sang in radical and revolutionary party headquarters, street busking, Christmas caroling, national lesbian and gay conferences, legal centres, universities, events of the religious right, youth reg refuges, music venues, cabarets, women's spaces, panniers, town halls and caravans. We sang to the gay and lesbian communities. We entertained the gay and lesbian movements and joined them in songs of protest and direct action. We played our part in the queering of the left, reviving its tradition of revolutionary song. We performed in the mobilising spaces of trade unions and the radical and progressive social movements of the time. The choir also used its numbers, costumes and street theatre to challenge and disrupt activities of the religious right. This is at the Gay Centre when we had a Gay Centre, which sounds very like another time. It's in Holt Street in Surrey Hills. The choir took its message not only to the emerging gay male community and its venues, but to suburban and outer metropolitan community groups like the Poly Olympics and Group 11 at Mulgoa, and communities in the Hunter and the North Coast. They weren't always prepared for the politics or the blasphemy. Law reform and police were high on the repertoire. 
bit of a dark picture that it was taken at night. The choir sang to Premier Neville Ran on several occasions from a caravan parked across the road from his bedroom window, which has been credited with contributing significantly to law reform. It was immortalised in the Embassy song, and I'll sing you the first few bars of that. Neville Ran and Jill looked out one September morning. Wallace Street looks rather queer, Jill remarked while yawning. What's that object over there, decked out in gay bunting? Little did this pair surmise what they were confronting. <laughs> anyway. The song I am going to play for you is a little bit feistier than that. It's called We Are Fighting Back. The song was for a rally opposing police raids on Club 80, which was a sex on premises venue, in 1983. So, thank you, Tim. Oh, you can sing it, it's in your notes. slogans and anthems. It collaborated with them collective endeavours. It also sang to the emerging equality groups and networks. And I'm going to play for you Sex and Vice, which uh, was a favourite audience participation song of the choirs. Uh, it was sung to the tune of Idol Vice, the words by David Fagan. Paul in the songbook described it as a victimisation waltz, a call to the old Vienna and present day Darlinghurst. <coughs> so, uh, when you're ready, Tim.
Bit of a slow start. Never can be in right on time. Party, the Socialist Workers' Party, and the Anarchists. We sang to Marxist summer schools and on May Day marches. We collaborated with trade unions and left groups in their campaigns and actions. For example, in December 1983, and in solidarity with lesbians experiencing homophobia at the Department of Social Security Office in Clarence Street, the choir took advantage of the marvellous acoustics in the waiting area and did a set. Yes. In May 85, we sang at the rough end of the pineapple, a benefit at the Belvoir Street Theatre for the Seacook Workers Strike Fund, and at the time South East Queensland electricity workers were fighting privatisation. And wouldn't we have cheaper electricity if we had also done that? We shared the bill and the dressing room, which was all made us so nervous, with the Flying Pickets, Jeannie Lewis and the Castanet Club, and we were received, according to the diary, with thunderous applause with the, by the capacity crowd. And as I mentioned earlier, the choir performed in the mobilising spaces of the radical and progressive social movements of the time and opposing neoliberal military and economic adventurism. We sang for the release of the Ananda Mark III in support of El Salvador and the Nicaraguan revolutions um, and opposing the Marcos regime in the Philippines and the apartheid regime in South Africa. We sang in solidarity and coalition with the peace, nuclear disarmament, environment and indigenous rights movements of the period. After women joined the choir and before it worked on its new material, its members joined with the group 
campaign against re repression to get the train together to Chatswood and disrupt the launch of Festival of Light at Jim Cameron's Tilt at the New South Wales Legislative Council at Willoughby Town Hall. And uh, here he is at the Equality Rally in uh, 84. <coughs> and this is one of the choir's street theatre masterpieces with an Oral Riches Rally, a parody of the US evangelist Oral Roberts, the choir, being the Richettes, appropriately clothed in safari, safari suits and white ties, with parodies of far-right placards like Elvis Presley, Son of Satan and Ban the Bum. <laughs> the lesbians presented in sensible frocks, hats and accessories as women who want to be ladies. <laughs> we were positioned either side of the entrance. We sang some of their big hits with the lyrics unchanged. The ironic Just As I Am with Sforzando on the line O Lamb of God, I come, I come. <laughs> and the blood hymns, there is a fountain filled with blood and the wondrous family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain drenched in his blood. So yes, they were the blood hymns. In his crippling suit and ten gallon hat and holding a spray bottle of no frills blood of the lamb and a megaphone, Oral Riches thundered his four square gospel of feminism, socialism, gay liberation and ethnic pride. Hallelujah. Strangely, Despite being right in the middle of things, the police never arrived and no one tried to move us on. I'm convinced to this day that people weren't really sure where we were from the very far right. So when they filed out of the venue, we were still going. So this kind of confrontation became a favourite tactic. There's Oral there again. Here we are, another pick. This one's from the Rally for Oral, disrupting the Mary Whitehouse tour on the steps of Sydney Town Hall in July 84. The placard you can see just out of picture, bottom left, reads, Prawns are an abomination, Leviticus 11, 9, 12. <laughs> Here's choir member, the late sister come dancing. There will have been a lot of people in these images who've passed and you would have noticed that. Colin's here facing off against a festival of lighter. Oh, so some internal stuff. The choir rehearsed weekly. It had a collective, collectivist process and consensus decision making. The meetings were open. There were no auditions for new members. Possibly unique among choirs that never had a conductor or a musical director, though it did have a guitarist, a piano accordionist, and a, pian a later a pianist to help keep tempo and pitch, and that was Chrissy Miles, another person who sadly is no longer with us. There were no sexual identity requirements for potential members, and not everyone was homosexual. I had many workshops, including weekends away, to focus on choral singing skills, learn new material and other skills, such as choreograph flag twirling, <laughs> and also to sort out process issues, discuss politics and performance strategies, have a good time and sing a lot. Over the years, the choir had a repertoire of 77 songs. The nature of homosexual oppression was a theme of many of the songs, and the tactic of coming out was well represented in them. Many songs had a feminist or socialist theme or promoted social change or revolution at home and abroad. Some referred to particular groups and events in the movement. Some songs were intended as a sacrilege on the religious right. Some supported homosexual law reform or dramatised police activities and corruption, though there were some themes that were not in the repertoire. There were no appeals to nation and nationalism. 
The word Australia appears once in a song, an American song from Randy Newman, Political Science. We'll save Australia, don't want to hurt no kangaroo. We'll build an old American amusement park there. They got surfing too. They got surfing too. There were no appeals to respectability or normality, no coyness about sex, no serious love songs. There were no expressions of quality through citizenship and songs promoted difference rather than sameness. We sang songs about relationships, separations, love, sex and parodies of romance and monogamy. None of these mentioned same-sex marriage, but several did mention divorce. So, that's the end of my little part for the moment, everybody. And uh, now I'm going to call Marie to step up and share her story with us. Thank you, Marie. So I was going to speak off the cuff, but um, about 11 o'clock last night, I thought, oh my God, what if I get nervous? I better write all this down. So, so I sacrificed my morning swim and bike ride to stay up and ride this out, so bear with me. So I was invited to tell my story as a member of the Gay Liberation Choir, which I keenly participated in from 1984 to 1986. I said, I, when David asked me, I said I would feel more comfortable singing than talking, but hopefully there'll be a bit of time for some singing in a while when we get the talking out of the way. We've already done some singing and we'll do some more. Um, so a little bit about me back then and how I came to be part of this choir at the forefront of radical cultural activism during the 1980s, according to the poster. So it's a, um, it's a, big, um, a big ask to live up to, but I think we did it. Um, so first slide for Marie. Yay. Okay. So, here's me on the morning of the morning march on the 24th of June, in the middle in the morning of the infamous first Mardi Gras, when lots of people were arrested that evening. Um, I haven't found any photos or film footage of myself in the evening march, but I was definitely there with my girlfriend Sandy, who's here today. <laughs> my girlfriend there, <laughs> and um, and my school friend Felicity. Um, I think was with us, and um, and we marched up to King's Cross with the. I think we joined the parade at um, College Street, and then we went all the way, um, which hadn't been planned, and you know the rest of it is history. Um, so yeah, just to share that I witnessed um, people being grabbed and thrown into paddy wagons, including Caroline King, who I had known from Macquarie Uni, who was walking along near me when she was grabbed and thrown into the paddy wagon. And um, I remember thinking at the time, well, she was targeted because she was, you know, um, she belonged to a political party and, um, um, but it was very violent. I just remember that, um, you know, wow, so close, but it wasn't me because I wasn't um, a leader of the, of the political movements and, um, and she definitely was. So, um, and sadly she's, um, her name is, also on the list here today because I added it at Fair Day this year. And, uh, and the rest was history, as you would be well aware of the story and events that unfolded that night. So, um, so yeah, here I am with Sandy on the morning of the, that March. Um, and um, so I hadn't um, seen that image before, but my daughter Roisin, who's also here now, sitting up the back, um, who was living in France earlier this year, contacted me and, and I told her that I was going to go along to the, to the 40th um, anniversary and, and she was looking at some YouTube footage and, um, and said, hey mum, I think I've seen you, I think I saw someone that looks maybe looked like you, but of course she didn't know me back then because she's not that old. <laughs> and so I, I trawled through some um, YouTube clips and, um, and found Sandy and me. So here we are. Um, yeah, so in 1978 I was fresh out of university. I'd been a full-time student at Macquarie Uni, where I guess you could say I was radicalised into socialism, feminism, gay rights, black rights, 
nuclear disarmament, anti-American cultural imperialism, and all of the other isms that um, David mentioned. Um, there was certainly a lot to demonstrate about then, as there is now. So, on a personal level, in 1978, I was living with my boyfriend, Graham, and, um, and this lesbian from Melbourne moved in next door, and I was curious and attracted, and um, so Sandy and I got together, and Graham and I broke up, and Sandy and I moved in together, and we were together for two or three years. And, um, and we socialised in the gay and lesbian subculture and we moved in and out of gay and lesbian share houses and we hung out at Ruby Red's lesbian nightclub and we went to women's dances. So as David was saying, you know, it was a, it was a diverse um, era and, um, and I guess it was, um, it was hard to be slotted into a particular little um, subculture of the subcultures, but um, I think I mixed in, in all of those diverse um, little subgroups. Um, and in the early 80s, I joined the Gay Waves Radio Collective. We broadcast a three-hour weekly radio program on 2SER FM at 10 p.m. on Thursday nights. And this was a group of lesbians and gay men working together, and we provided an important service to the gay and lesbian community. And this was way before mobile phones, internet, email, and social media. And we had lots of fun and played great music. So. I think it was, a, you know, it was a great way to, well, it was one-way communication over the radio, of course, but there was lots of, lots of um, phone-ins and requests and um, we played all our favourite gay songs and um, it was, I think it was a very vital part of the community service. Um, so I think this was how I came to join the choir when the women joined the choir in 1984. Again, it was another opportunity of women and men working collaboratively in our common causes. And um, you know, so homosexual law reform for gay men was just a few months away. It had never been illegal for women. And um, this was in an era of when some lesbians became separatists and wanted nothing to do with men, gay men included. But in our new look gay liberation choir, some lyrics were tweaked and verses added to be inclusive of women and we presented a harmonious front singing to change the world in our diverse radical causes. So, back to me. After the choir wound up in the late 1980s, some of us went on to join the newly formed Solidarity Choir, including myself. And when my biological clock was ticking away, I eventually went on to have two daughters with a man, and he died when the children were quite young, and I became a single parent, and that set my trajectory for the next couple of decades working full-time and parenting. So not a lot of time for political activism, but um, a bit here and there, and I think I took the girls on on marches, they'll probably remember, and um, yeah, they were more radicalised by me than, than what I give myself credit for, I think. Um, so yeah, I know that both my girls are thrilled that I'm finding my way back to my authentic self, whatever that may be, and it was great to reconnect with the 78ers for the 40th Mardi Gras this year, slide three. Oh, sorry, that's slide two. That's, that's me in the choir in my red tie in the front. And I'm um, not sure what that one was for, but I know Sheridan and I have both got the red ties and the white shirts, so maybe someone can um, recall that what that was all about. I think we might have done a little tap dance routine or something. But um, anyway. Consult, I'll consult the data. Good, thank you, Dave. Consult the data. Good. Okay, so um, yeah, so here I am at um, um, outside the bus at the beginning of the parade this year, 40 years on, Sandy and me. <laughs> and um, yeah, I felt um, um, very comfortable singing and dancing in Taylor Square with the 78ers dance group singing I Am What I Am. Next slide. <laughs> Found this photo. <laughs> So I hadn't actually seen a photo and, um, and Roisin and Nico actually watched the live um, broadcast on SBS and, and live streamed it and sent me screenshots and they were the only screenshots, the only proof that I had that I was dancing <laughs> until I saw the, um, the annual report that, that Di issued and <laughs> I ran up the front dancing. So, 
So I was singing, I am what I am, and I felt very authentic in my bewildered self, not really sure of where I fit in with the, with the gay movement, but um, I think I fit very neatly these days. Um, yeah, next slide. Um, yeah, so that's at the end of the march, and that's with my other daughter, Maeve, and Sandy, and Sandy Banks after the parade. Um, I think that's the end of the slides for me. Yep, okay. So, um, so now just some anecdotes from my two years in the choir. Um, I couldn't really remember much about the events, but I think David's um, explained a lot. Explained them. Good. Sorry. That's all right. All right. Okay, I'll just duck. So I probed through my music stool, um, piano stool, which has um, in recent, more recent decades been, um, been added to by my daughter's musical stuff from school. And at the very bottom, I found the bottom of the closet, my choir folder. And so that's prompted some, um, some memories for me. So I've got here a, um, a, a set list from the cabaret in Brisbane, uh, where we sang In the Mood, Tango, Steam Heat, Teddy Bear's Picnic, Festival of Light, Political Science, Thank You Lord, Ayuna no Hair and Pink Triangle. And in the daytime, we sang Avanti Popolo, Country Town Gay Time Blues, Down by the River, World Winds of Danger, Festival of Light, Union Made, Thank You Lord, Homosexuality, to the tune of Mickey Mouse, Sex Advice, and we must have practiced the conference is over. Mm. And then in Lismore, we, um, we did the Country Town Gay Time Blues, Tango, Thank You Lord, Festival of Light, Avanti Popolo, and then for the Double Dutch Restaurant, Steam Heat, Down by the Riverside, and Sex and Vice. So, a little bit of paper. Um, yeah, it was nice to come across these original song sheets, 40-year-old bits of paper, or <laughs> um, well, 30-something-year-old bits of paper, and some of them are actually in... Um, Quilt at length, which you don't see much of these days. I had to <laughs> tuck them into my A4 folder. Um, and um, yeah, I came across the old uh, one with um, the lyrics for "Thank You Lord for Gay Liberation" that hadn't had the um, the women's verse added, and the um, changed of changed from um, that makes us all makes us all queens, so we changed it to makes us, makes dykes and queens. And um, it's with men I'm messing, we changed that to it's with queers I'm messing. And um, what have we done to our darling son, we changed that what have we done to our darling one. And um, in the extra verse, um, which, um, which you'll get to sing because it's on the lyrics in front of you. Um, I think that's about it. Oh yes, and that was me in the red hat in David's presentation at the um, the Oral Richards, um, or Oral Richards, I believe he calls himself these days. But I have in my hot little hand the original program, <laughs> the Oral Richards 1984 Crusade, a revival of the four square gospel of socialism, feminism, gay liberation, and ethnic pride. Hallelujah, and the um, and the blood songs and um, all the rest that David alluded to earlier. So yeah, that's it for me, and uh, I'll hand you over to Paul. Thanks for that, Marie. That's fantastic. I'm going to introduce Paul now. Paul Van Wright is going to tell his story. Okay, so my story is going to be um, a little bit different because uh, David's covered a lot of the choir history and Marie has given um, some additional um, history, particularly from um, when uh, women joined the choir famously under a clothes hoist 
<laughs> in a backyard in Marrickville when we were doing our fundraiser for the Marrickville Legal Centre. It was kind of a little surprise that we kept up up our sleeve. The boys sang a few songs, then suddenly the girls came out and joined, and it was, um, yeah, a, a wonderful, wonderful kind of moment. Um, what I thought I might do was, um, apart from leaving you the opportunity of asking questions about all the things we haven't talked about, or in fact sharing uh, your memories with us about what you perceived of us, because I'm sure it was very different what we perceived of ourselves. Um, I've got to tell the story of um, how um, I got to be a founding member of the Gay Liberation Choir um, uh, and one of its lyricists. Um, it's kind of a, a mini biopic in the vein of Whitney and Amy, but there's less drugs, anorexia, and heavy eyeliner. Uh, so it started when I was a toddler. I was entranced by my father and my brothers um, gathered around, my father and his brothers gathered around the piano at the Van Wright Clan Christmas party in Sri Lanka. Um, all of them sang very well, all the brothers, um, though none sang professionally. I've got no idea why um, the women of the family didn't sing, they just didn't do it. Um, the songs, unsurprisingly, were very popular songs of the 30s, 40s and uh, 50s. Uh, Roll Out the Barrel, um, Old Father Thames, uh, Heart of My Heart. My Uncle Algie would, uh, at some stage when he was slightly his cup, serenade his wife with Nita Hohanita, uh, which was because his wife's name was Nita, and that was his party trick to sing Nita Hohanita. You get the picture. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, among all my own siblings um, and my cousins, um, it was I who began to join singing uh, with the with brothers. Um, my, I, I still remember myself sort of clinging to the side of the, the upright piano, you know, where this sort of, sort of keyboard ends, there's a bit of a ridge, and I'd, I'd hang on there while my uh, uncle Desmond, um, who was a pianist in the family, would play these songs and every now and then suddenly break out into a, a jazz impro chorus or a swing beat. Um, and it was wildly exciting for me uh, being there. Um, and then um, I began doing my own little number at the family gatherings. Uh, what a surprise that was. Um, I would sing, Marie, Marie, the dawn is breaking, Marie, you'll soon be waking. This was an Irving Berlin song, um, and I sang it because I had an aunt called Marie. And so I would trot it out every Christmas, Paul's turn, Paul's turn, now sing Marie for us. And I would. <laughs> I got a reputation as having a good voice, uh, which spilled over into my school. Um, the first time I recall performing in public uh, was when I was in kindy. I was Little Jack Horner fast asleep under a haystack in a segment of tableaus of nursery rhymes. Um, it was a non-singing role, however. Uh, my first singing role was as the Spanish captain's daughter, who says, oh no, John, no, John, no, John, no, as John keeps wanting, uh, you know, pleading with her to marry him. Um, John was played by Howard Pereira, oh God, darkly handsome with black curly hair. Uh, I, on the other hand, was appearing in my first drag role, wearing a, a black crepe mantilla, a silk bodice of mint green, above a sea green layered tulle full-length skirt, and now and then coquettishly hiding my, fan, my face behind a fan. Um, when we got our first record player, uh, I discovered musicals. Uh, the King and I and My Fair Lady were the two I played over and over till they became a part of my DNA. Um, this was also the time that I um, first got paid for singing. Uh, well, actually, it was more that my mother, on long car trips, used to pay me not to sing. <laughs> she was as over it. Um, there were also the, baby, the BBC radio music shows from which I learned the Andrew Sisters repertoire. Uh, Ramen Coca Cola, when I finally tasted it, was nothing special, I thought. <laughs> um, uh, I learned the songs of the crooners, Bing Crosby, Frank Sinatra, Perry Como, Harry Belafonte. And then there were the two EPs of Nina and Frederick. I'm just waiting to see if anybody remembered. Anybody? You know, some of you know Nina and Frederick? Yeah, right. They were a, a, a Dutch and Danish husband and wife team. I think she was like a baroness or something. Um, and they introduced me to what I call the soft core end of folk songs. Uh, things like, there's a hole in the bucket, dear Eliza, dear Eliza, you know, kind of songs you get embarrassed about singing these days, not really, I still sing it. 
Um, but they're also saying uh, Calypso songs, which are kind of the new vogue, um, you know, uh, Jamaica Farewell uh, and uh, Yellow Bird High Up in the Banana Tree, which you would never sing again now because, you know, it's kind of a mock Cajun, a mock Creole. Um, finally, though, there was the thrill of climbing the stairs. Um, every Sunday, uh, the choir loft off St. Philip Neri's church with my father, and I would get goosebumps uh, as the all-male choir sang hymns in Latin and the incense drifted up into the rafters as the priest would raise this monstrance. Look, how many of you are Catholics? So you know this, right? He raises the monstrance for the Blessed Sacrament and then singing uh, Tantamago, blah, 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 etc. Fabian knows it. Um, and this, this just used to entrance me. Um, I, I, I'd still, when, when I was in high school, I still enjoy, I, I'd given up um, going to church uh, when I was 15. Um, I just basically said one day I'm not going. Um, my parents cried, but that was too bad for them. Um, but I, I was going to a Catholic school, Patricia Brothers Fairfield, and I still really enjoyed um, going to the ch going to Mass every Friday, uh, every once a month on Friday, uh, to sing from the new hymnal that we had, which was this kind of radical new song. We're going to try to remember the name of the person who put it together, but it was full of um, Negro spiritual or black spiritual then, um, and also some of the new folk idiom. Um, although we didn't have anybody, you know, sort of a happy, clappy, fine tooth going up front there singing along, but we'd be singing, Sons of God, here's holy word. And we'd do it like that with the cadets standing next to us. It was hysterical, but the, the brothers kind of didn't cut on. Um, all of this then uh, became a significant part of my contribution to the choir, not just my voice, uh, but tunes to which I would later put the lyrics. How am I doing in time? A minute. Oh, Lord. Oh, All right. Um, then there were the two stimuli for me embarking, in fact, on topical satirical lyrics. Uh, the first was Mad Magazine, um, which I used to read avidly as a teenager. And those of you who remember that, re read it, would remember that quite often each copy had both um, a musical that had been reworked in a topical way, um, but also uh, songs about topical, uh, songs about, you know, that were reworked into songs. Um, on, about issues. I remember one which was um, to the tune of We're on the Eve of Destruction, uh, but it was actually about the sort of stuff that we see these days with light rail and West Connects, and it was um, uh, You Can't Get Through, The Road Is Under Construction. Um, and there was a, a musical I, I, I remember from which I learned a lot about black politics. It was done to the musical of Corgi and Bess, and it was about black power um, in America. Um, I guess the, the, just very quickly going through. Um, I then started listening and, and becoming a musical actor, I guess. I'd buy Peter Paul and Mary records, uh, Malvina Reynolds, um, and of course, Bob Dylan. Um, then that, that, that kind of started for me, my track into social justice or, or activism. I'd sing these songs and it ended up with me and um, a couple of others from high school uh, then ending up in our last year of high school, going to the moratorium, and that was my first kind of activism. Um, I'll go very quickly to the door. Um, I, um, no, that's okay. Um, now, contrary to popular belief, and contrary to all the efforts to, of appropriation, I was not a 78er. Um, oh, God, he's done it now. Uh, um, do you even know that there was a gay movement in 1978? It wasn't even on my radar, because I was at uni too busy tripping um, or um, falling in love with heterosexual men um, and failing miserably at being heterosexual when I was. Um, I, did was I was an activist in other areas. Um, I did um, go, as I said, on the moratoriums. I um, mean, in, in the kind of incipient um, conservation movement, I once dressed up as a tree and handed out leaflets in George Street. <laughs> But it was gay activism um, that really resonated with me and became a vital part of who I am in the world. Um, within months of coming out, uh, quite late when I was in my uh, late 20s, um, I had joined the collective organizing the National Homosexual Conference, joined Gay Solidarity Group, and within a year I was sharing a house with Ken Davis and John Cazane, uh, both also from GSG, which I have elsewhere described as gay far left central. Um, Ken had been a pa part of the far left since um, I, I think he hit high school, or possibly even earlier. Um, and he still has what I think is the best collection of 
um, songs of activism internationally. I mean, the, every language is basically represented in there, virtually every struggle. And we play these and uh, House in Birchko uh, regularly. And somewhere in there, they put, as I mentioned, 1981, we kind of came up with this notion with others of revitalizing um, both the gay, gay movement and the left by singing, by bringing back these songs that, or, or well, bringing some back, but also writing new songs to uh, talk to the issues that, that we were dealing with, and that's what Gay Solidarity Choir was from. Um, I, I, I did want to just tell you, uh, I wanted to just remind you what it looked like to have a performance of ours. Um, Marie's mentioned some, but this is what the first performance we ever did had as a song list. And I think it's, it's, it really captures what the, um, the kind of uh, uh, context and, 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 and content of the choir was. Uh, we're saying we want our freedom, the teddy bear's picnic, a happy gaze, um, and God help you, Mary Dykes and Fuchs. Now those were written by Jenny and Helen Palsacker and were in the, one of the first kind of rad queer songbooks I ever got. Um, we did Festival of Life, uh, which was, at, by that said, Judy Small's uh, song, of course, and we later wrote some other verses for it about uh, the Festival of Life attacking um, Caligula, which was worth attacking, but not because of what they were doing, it was just a really shit film. Um, and um, we sang Big Bob Soldiers, and we sang that um, straight faced uh, because we sang it in recognition of the uh, queers who had been murdered by the Nazis. And of course, at that stage, the big triangle was, um, and still is for me, uh, the flag under which I choose to uh, do my um, GLBTIQ activism. Um, we sang Bandera Rossa, which we took from um, the Eureka Songbook, the Eureka League Songbook, uh, which I'd come across when I was a, uh, in my last year as a student, uh, batching with some uh, ex-commie uh, teachers who were in the Eureka Youth League. Um, we changed the words of that to call on, uh, um, it, it's a song that calls on Italian partisans to come out under the red flag. We changed it to be both about uh, homosexuals and lesbians to come out under the pink flag, um, which was, our first kind of radical, uh, rewriting the song. But not the pink flag of the Christian Democrats. No, no, certainly not. Um, and we also say, Malcolm Fraser had a farm, which was a, a, a totally openly political song about Malcolm at the time. Um, just, just to wrap up, um, I, I wanted to emphasize what, what David said. I, I think what was fantastic about the choir was that we not only um, sang songs at non-gay and lesbian solidarity events, and in fact became kind of the darlings of the, the, the circuit at that stage, you know. We were called up virtually every week to be at some fundraiser or on some march and they'd say, hey, can you sing? I think what was really significant about it is that people who asked us knew that we would invariably always sing gay and lesbian songs as well as songs of the other struggles. We never did a program where we didn't combine those two. And to me, what that did was actually build bridges in ways that other, you know, you, you might have walked marks with them, but to be there and be singing these songs to an audience who really quite often hadn't thought about the issues or certainly were reluctant to be engaged with them, um, I think was 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 uh, fantastic and uh, and really significant. I'm glad that uh, David kind of talked about those. Um, look, there are other stories I could tell you, but let's um, leave them for later. Um, but that was how I came to know you, the Gay Liberation Choir. Right, so we're going to take a little break now, and that will give you time to buy the raffle tickets of Cherie and her helpers. And we've got some fabulous prizes. We've got David Irk pictures of the choir. We've got beer, we've got wine, we've got chocolates, we've got other things as well. And uh, we'll be drawing that after the break, or at the end of today's uh, forum. And uh, we'll be having a Q&A with our speakers and some more songs when we come back. So we'll take a 15 minute break now. Don't go away. <laughs> so uh, once our speakers are up front having a seat, I'm going to open the floor to questions. OK, who wants to ask a question, Annie? I just wanted to say that, you know, now that we've got the gay marriage, if we want it, I, I was just thinking about the, um, 
immigration, the gay immigration marriages and the gay immigration song that the choir sang, wrote and sang. Um, yes. I mean, uh, clearly that wasn't a question. Uh, yeah, that was one of the, we, uh, as a group, I remember sitting around one night, uh, the, the men and the women had joined by that stage, and um, we did it for the Gay and Lesbian Immigration Task Force, which was um, the group that was pushing forward um, the Gay and Lesbian Immigration at that time. Um, Ken would probably remember more about what politics of it was, but it was a great song because we did it to um, the tune of the Jackie Trent, Tony Hatch song, The Two of Us. Um, and it, it goes through a series of, of verses where this couple who want to try and um, come into Australia um, meet various bureaucrats that will get to the minister. Um, and uh, I, I can't remember if there's a happy ending or not. I, I think there was a happy ending. I think we were kind of upbeat at that stage. Yeah, oh, that's right, that's right. We just kept. Yeah, as we said each verse, and somebody else came along, we'd go, yeah, there's the three of us now, now there's the four of us. And it was also partly about how many people had, you know, got involved um, in that and how complex the kind of situation was. Um, yeah. I just know uh, that when we had same-sex, well, uh, same-sex com same reforms to Commonwealth law in 2009, the special provisions which the Gay Immigration Task Force, Gay and Lesbian, Immigration Task Force had fought for were all lost and replaced by the new de facto um, definition. So, a sad thing. Questions? Or comments? Well, it, it's going to be a question, but I just want to say that I thought that was a, a terrific assortment of points of view that certainly took me back to that era. It was great, and thank you. Um, what Part of what it took me back to, I guess, was what the pointy end was then 35 years ago. If you were starting to go to the Liberation Choir now, what would the pointy end be? I'm having to get my head around the metaphor because I learned how to speak English from gay men. <laughs> Which is why everyone asks me if I'm English or middle class. And if I was starting a gay liberation choir now, look, I don't think we got gay liberation, so I think you could start one any time. And we aren't free from oppression. Oppression keeps... Things change, they don't get better or worse, they just keep changing, and the things that we fought for aren't recognisable because the material conditions that created them aren't there anymore. I don't think there could be a gay liberation choir now in some ways because I don't think the commission get the conditions are there that to, to generate that kind of outcome anymore. Anyone else? I was just reflecting that um, one of the songs the choir did which was very radical at the time, David mentioned that we sang for youth refuges. So we sang at the opening of the twenty ten youth refuge, which in itself was extraordinary. Um, Frank Walker put money forward, the wonderful Labour uh, Minister of Community Services, and I put money forward to set up a refuge for kids who basically the law could have imprisoned at any stage, you know, because we didn't have decriminalisation at that, that point. Um, and we very cheekily did a reworking of um, uh, I'm 16 going on 17 because the, the bill, uh, correct me again, Ken, if I'm wrong, but there was the, the uh, Yeomans was trying to make some amendment around the age of consent. And I think it's, it's still a song that's, that's valid in the context of the stuff that's going on with kids in, in schools now, you know. It, we were absolutely determined to sing a song um, acknowledging and supporting gay and lesbian teenagers uh, to, for, for the right for them to be able to express their sexuality like our heterosexual kids did as well. And I think that, that, that still, as we know, um, you know, this idiocy about, oh, we can't um, change the, the law about discrimination because you might have gay kids in Catholic schools forming gay clubs. Well, that was the cadets as far as I remember. <laughs> <laughs> um. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting. The um, you know, with with um, marriage equality last year, um, and I think you know a lot of us came from that era when we didn't believe in marriage. It was a totally different time. So, um, but that's another that's another whole story. <laughs> um, yeah. That's uh, probably one of the things I've just thought of is that about 98% of our tactics that were commonly used in those days we wouldn't get away with now. We would be bundled up, we would be arrested, no one would know where we've gone. If we told anyone, they would be arrested too. Uh, we live in a framework of national security that's... And we've happily given up so many of our freedoms mm. And as I always think of the right-wing American said, uh, the people who give up their freedom from security deserve neither freedom nor security. And that's what I think. I like dangerous life, you know. And look, I mean, I mean we, we know also, um, speaking of immigration, um, the situation of uh, refugees who are of diverse sexuality. You know, it's not as if these things have got suddenly wiped away by everybody running off to get married. Um, and I suspect I might be one of whom the choir would write a song about, hey, so what's so great about marriage? You know, to the tune of love and marriage, I'd remind people that, you know, that's a song about, uh, yeah, it's an antithetical song because I, I suspect some of the things we might say are about those kind of certainties that, that we have these days, that, that the sort of hope which towards heteronormativity or homonormativity, um, I think has to be the sort of thing that we would probably still sing about. Um, and, and the other part of that is that I, I think we would still sing the songs of those other struggles. Labour struggles still go on, you know. Um, we used to sing uh, Union Made, that fantastic song about a union woman being really strong. And when you still think that you've got a gender pay gap, I mean, for fuck's sake, it, you know, um, casualisation of labour. Those are still still things I think that we would, as, as a choir, have uh, taken on um, and been prepared to uh, sing about because um, they, they're still the kind of things that, for you know, all old-fashioned socialists like me, um, are important and which we would have asked the choir to 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 sing. It was a good, great question. Yeah. Good question. Uh, hi, I wanted to say something and ask a question. So I think in, if the Gay Liberation Choir was still around, God forbid, um, I think the scope for satirising the far right and the Christian right is actually much greater now, and the threat is much greater now than back there when we were sort of winning, um, and now we're sort of losing. And um, I think also we were always very internationalist, and the situation for transgender and lesbian and gay people in a lot of places is getting rapidly worse, like Brazil. So I think there would be a role in a lot of ways. But the question I was going to ask is, like, related to what Marie said, that um, she went from the Gay Liberation Choir in 87 to Solidarity Choir. And I can't really remember the end of the Gay Liberation Choir at all. And what happened with Solidarity Choir is um, the anti-apartheid movement wanted a choir to sing um, for the visit of Oliver Tambo. And um, uh, outside the town hall, um, uh, Tony Abbott was burning car tyres and saying that ANC was terrorist, and this was 87. And uh, the Gay Solidarity Choir and the Cafe at the Gate of Salvation and the Mambologists and one other choir, under the leadership of the African National Congress, formed a choir to sing African songs to welcome the president of the ANC. And then that combination went forward in a fairly successful way and sang for the visit of Mandela on the Opera House and the Cathedral in 1990. So there's something about what David said about a contribution of rebuilding a, a political choir culture, which then other parts of the left took up. But the question in that is, I can't remember the end of the Gay Liberation Choir. Uh, the other group involved in that broader singing group was Voices from the Bacon Lot. Um, I do remember the winding up of the choir. There were about six or seven of us. We were in a little park on the end of Birchgrove Point. 
and we, I suppose the biggest thing we had to do was to decide what we would do with our $25.80 that was in the bank and who we'd give it to. <laughs> there was, I suppose there was a sense that, well, at the time that, that we'd done what we had to do and that we didn't have, I don't know, other people might reflect on that question. Look, I think the other thing to remember is that those last few years for the men in the choir um, and the women in the choir um, was, were the early years of AIDS. Um, and a lot of our energy um, got put into that. And, and a lot of the, the early deaths in the, of men in the choir were certainly um, AIDS deaths. Um, and I think in a sense, we were tired of the God. Look at the number of performances we did in a very short space of time. I was recalling that there were times um, you'd do two and three performances in a week. And that was just ridiculous, uh, you know, because we, nobody else was doing it. Um, and I think that was important. And, and it just got, I think, very, uh, yeah, kind of tired and a bit worn out. I don't know, Marie? I guess um, in a way it had sort of served its um, purpose and um, and to a certain extent it's it's mixing in a subculture. We were, you know, it was part of what we did. We, it was, it was um, our gay lives, you know, amongst each other. Um, but also, you know, as, as Ken said, we were um, going to more diverse events and... Um, and singing, being invited. Um, yeah, you know, it was a different, a different time. I think, you know, going into the Solidarity Choir, which I did, um, and I'd actually gone overseas for six months, I think, so um, I don't think I was here for the, for the beginning with the Oliver Tambo event, but um, um, it was certainly wonderful to, um, you know, when Mandela got out of prison and, and came here, and because we'd sung we, you know, in the Solidarity Choir, we'd gone to greet the um, the ANC Cultural Ensemble. I remember at the airport, and um, of course they took hours to get through because of all their um, skins and drums and <laughs> and feathers and things they weren't allowed. And um, so we were sort of resting outside, and then um, suddenly we um, we got told they're here, they're here, and we raced into the foyer of the airport at you know 11 o'clock at night or something, and we just burst into into song, singing the um, the ANC, um, um, the national anthem. And um, the security guards, like everybody just stood still. It was, and they were there like, who are these people greeting us with our, with our song in our language? It was, um, it was a wonderful moment. And I mean, a lot of us had come from the, um, the Gay Liberation Choir to merge into, you know, to emerge into this more diverse culture, more diverse choir with, with other, um, other participants as well, so I mean that's a little, a little aside. It's but you know, that's sort of the thing that we morphed into, and that was a certainly a wonderful moment in my life that I'll never forget. The Solidarity Choir is still going, of course, yes. thirty something years on. Uh, I was one of the two conductors for the Solidarity Choir for its first twelve or fifteen years. And at the point where I finished being the conductor, I it was the point at which I was the only homosexual left in the solidarity choir. So, you know, it changed over time. People don't have the, can't give the whole life to one pursuit. Life's more important than that. And we all have to do what's important. Annie, yes, no, this, is, this is actually just reflecting back on um, not being able to remember the end of the choir and Natalie and I both remember it quite clearly and I know that Penny remembers it quite clearly and we all felt that it was finished on us and and some people went on to bigger and better things and I you know that's not in any way I mean you know that was then and this is now and uh, we understand you know like everything that you said puts that in context but I did in context but I didn't feel like there was a this is the other choir that's available and you know anybody's welcome to come to that so it's interesting that the people who left don't remember the leaving and the people who felt they were left did remember the leaving anyway, yes that's that right there were only a small number so did you want to make further point Annie 
listed all the things you said. <laughs> Sorry. All the things that you went on to say about the A, you know, responding to AIDS and Oliver Tambo coming and all those choirs and voices from the vacant lot and so on, all of that's very moving. So it just makes me feel like I'm nitpicking about the choir end, but you know, that was all really important stuff. Yeah. It's sort of a question and also a comment, but I want to thank you for your presentations today um, and for what the way that you really forged ahead through song and music and your wonderful lyrics for the LGBTI community back in the 80s. Um, I'm a member, a founding member of the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Choir and we formed in 1991. And we have kept a lot of that legacy alive because back then, in the early 90s, we were still singing um, around the AIDS wards at St Vincent's Hospital and singing in the, uh, the, the, the marches down Oxford Street on World AIDS Day uh, and singing on the, you know, the, for the opening of the quilt and things like that and still do that today. Um, in 1992, we, amongst a lot of controversy, applied to uh, compete in the National Choral Championships in Wagga and was asked to change our name and we bluntly refused to. Um, and we went on and we won the community section of the Choral Awards in Wagga and it actually got into both the Wagga Press and the Sydney Press. Um, and when I look back at the 27 years that I've been in the Gay and Lesbian Choir, um, times have changed. That would not happen today, I believe. Um, we have been asked to sing at all sorts of things like the Commonwealth Heads of Government um, opening night a few years ago. Um, this Friday we've been asked, we were invited to sing, and it's this Friday, um, at the human, the Australian Human Rights Awards. So I suppose in some respects we've become, and we've sung a lot of, of around marriage equality, we've, I guess we've become a little bit more mainstream, and that's not to say that there is still discrimination, uh, that there isn't still discrimination against LGBTI people. There certainly is, but it's, it's important that uh, that we continue to, to work together and, and it's important that we still have that voice through the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Choir. But we certainly acknowledge the great legacy that you left us from the 80s in what you gave us. So I'm sorry, that's more a comment but, uh, than, a, than a question. But um, I think we're all in, in all of this, you know, t together. So thank you. We're gonna, it's time to get you people singing. Um, I'm just going to get my guitar. Fabian's going to get his. Fabian's going to get his squeeze box out. So uh, Christmas. Yeah. Uh, Carl in the organising group Salon 78 has said, "Can you include a Christmas song? Yes. Because it's nearly Christmas. I keep. I. It's not in my diary though. Christmas." But I did include this song. Uh, God, God Help You, Mary Dykes and Poofs was written by Jenny Hapsita and Helen Pasker. It's in your song sheets, so sing along. This, this is a different quiet performance. Like That's right, we're taking a lot of farting around. <laughs> All starting, not on the same note and at the same time. Oh, you've got a special thing, where is it? Ah, 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 on my guitar there. Can you pass that along? I can. Now, here's an artefact, but I wasn't going to give it up for... This is the chromatic pitch instrument that drove the choir to pitch. <laughs> And it's 40-something years old. Wow. Yeah. All right, so uh, there's an introduction to this song, which... Uh, yeah, I'll bring that better, because I'll hit you with my guitar. I'm going to let John Schwarzkopf introduce the song in the original recording. 
and he'll yes. tell you all of your instructions. Thanks, Tim. This is, of course, the uh, widely famous Bowen Bridge. Uh, uh, <laughs> as you can see, we rushed straight from the cricket <laughs> to, uh, to bring you a, a program of family favourites. Having started on a, a, a festive season note, we thought we'd bring you two more numbers from our very lovely Christmas repertoire. Uh, the, you'll recognise the tunes with any luck. Uh, the words of the next one were written by uh, Jean Posica and they're published in the um, feminist sing-along songbook called Something Good. Uh, very slightly changed by the choir. Um, the song is concerned with the delights of family festivities and it's called God Help You, Mary Dykes and Paul. <laughs> Scope was always following, uh, not far behind, with Greg Redding Greg attached to it, who's over here. Uh, the recording we did of one of those carols uh, uh, was Silent Night, which I played on Gay Waves on the Thursday night of Christmas Eve. It has some blasphemy in it. Uh, thanks to uh, Fred Nile and Festival Live Move to have the radio station's licence revoked. And thanks to Pete Jackson, the manager, he shielded us from a blasphemy uh, yeah, yeah. conviction yeah. and, and good, good on him, went on to have a career in the Labour Party. Uh, I'll just add to what Paul said. We also once uh, busked outside Woolworths in Town Hall. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you win the pick, if you win the raffle tonight, today you'll be taking away a picture yeah. that's got a photo of us singing in Strand Arcade before we got moved on. Anyway, I'm going to go to the next song. Oh, we love this. Yep. Now, this is of course the uh, wide yeah. That's it. Okay, whirlwinds of danger. Now, I will just background this bit. This was a popular left tune. <laughs> Just, I just want to intro it, Jim. Tim, uh, there was there was a popular left tune used for a number of songs. Whirlwinds of Danger comes from the 1848 revolution in Poland, 
the words slightly modernised by the choir. It was first performed at the Marxist Summer School in January 1982. I considerably added to the tension in the room with a frenzied exhibition of tambourine, more in the Salvation Army tradition. This recording is from the backyard of Marrickville Legal Centre. It was such a poor recording that I added some vocoder parts to underpin the vocals. And then I got a little bit carried away in the studio and added drums and bass. So I'm going to play it for you. It's in your song sheets and you can sing along. Thank you, Lord, for Gay Liberation, the song most performed by the choir, 88 times. It was written for the choir by the Reverend Philip Wesley Stevenson. That was our pet name. It reflected the fashion of the time of women, country and western torch song singers. It used gay community narratives like coming out and truck driving man and working in a gay bar. I've sung it at least a thousand times, at <laughs> least, maybe two thousand, and it wasn't even my own story. I didn't have to leave home and work nights in a gay bar. I was a clever and feisty boy and it was my father who had to leave home. Yeah. I did work nights, though it was at the Arnott's chip factory in Yaguna. And it wasn't the truck drivers who had wandering hands in the loading dock, it was the van drivers. Hello. <laughs> the choir sang the song to the religious right, opposing its politics and disrupting its events. And in this context, the song had a different impact, particularly with us cross-dressing in the style of our opponents and with our own ev evangelist the Reverend Oral Riches in his gifted tongue. Tongue, sorry. Tongue. <laughs> it's in your song sheet, and so I'll bring you in on the guitar, and I'm hoping that the Reverend will be moved to find his voice. Yeah, you need to mention the... Um the run-on of the two... Oh, right, the structure of the song, right. So it's all written out as it's sung. There's two different kinds of chorus, which we always mucked up. Yeah. And 
Uh, now, verse number. Sorry, can I just check this? It's two from the bottom, basically. Four and five. Is it one, two, two. Oh, three and four. Now, verse three and four. The verse four follows verse three. We don't go to the chorus in there. That's good. That, that's how we used to trick the audience. <laughs>
Australia to fly members. Yeah. Now, we're just about to finish up and draw the raffle. And I'm going to ask Cherie uh, if she can come up and draw some raffles. And we might get Paul, who's still up here, to draw them. Oh. Side note to that song. We were singing for the launch of um, Judy Small's first album, The Fire Was One of the Actors. And we were just thinking, thank you Lord, for the liberation like we usually do. And suddenly, when we got to that particular point, from the band, Fabi starts preaching. The rest of us just lost it. Because <laughs> we'd never heard it before. Alright. Okay. Okay. And the prize is out. Okay. So, third prize, three cans of Young Henry's beer, a box of Ferrero Rocher chocolates, and a bottle of Jeanne's premium cuvee. Um, I remember doing this, I once won a chicken raffle at an RSL and I was supposed to give it back because I was also a guest speaker. Uh, green G51. G51? Some, somebody's putting their hand up. Yay, over here, hey, we've got that one. Excellent. Okay, second prize, a six pack of Young Henry's beer, a box of Ferrero Rocher chocolates, and a box pair of old fashioned glasses. Okay. Oh, those kind of old fashioned glasses. Glasses you make old fashioned then. Right. Yeah, not old fashioned, I think. Not old fashioned glasses. <laughs> Oh dear, they'd be called like bottle top glasses. Okay, here we go. Alright, and this time it is yellow, or if you, cut, if you like apricot, sorry, it's apricot. V47. Apricot V47. Oh, is it going to be a redraw? <laughs> no. Could it be no? Aha. Right. Uh -huh. Here, you can't have one. You're a member of the organizing group. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> And now, um, <laughs> you want to hold a picture up there? Excellent. A framed choir photograph by David Urquhart, and a pack of Young Andrews beer, and a box of Ferrero chocolates goes to. Ooh, can we have a drum roll, please, David? Sick fingers. Oh, attention, lessons. It's going to be. Green G73. Okay. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Sharif, for running the raffle for us. Thank you for our speakers, David, Paul, and Marie. And thank you, David, for doing the, the historical slides and, and information and that sort of thing. And thank you all for coming along. Please join with me in thanking our speakers once again.